Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Hallelujah. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and, and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation, and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not, I do not deserve to have you come under my, under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with Soldiers under me, I tell this one go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd, following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith, even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. This is the gospel of the Lord. It's sad, but nevertheless true. But the sinful nature tends to place our circumstances in life between us and God. Our fears, our worries, our losses, our victories. All kinds of things can get in between us and God. Today, as we consider the gospel lesson as the text for the sermon message, we find a very interesting story about one who obviously is <coughs> led by the Spirit's work through the gospel to believe in Jesus. And this man, in the example we have before us, did not allow the circumstances that had arisen in his life and that of his valued servant to get between him and God. Of this man's faith, Jesus says, it was great. Why great? Why was this man's faith great? Well, we find at least Three answers within this text of this, this sermon today, the gospel lesson. And one of those was immediate. We, we, we find that this unlikely candidate for a great faith, a Roman centurion, a pagan nation, in an occupied country where he was now stationed, should have a faith that Jesus would call great. But he did. It was first demonstrated or made apparent to everyone who heard this story and continues to hear it every three or four years in the gospel pericopes. But this man's faith was great, at least for one reason, because he, he thought of others first. Now that's not an easy thing to do. 
Because of our sinful nature, we have a tendency to put ourselves always first. We got the first cup of coffee out of the coffee maker this morning. We got the first piece of pumpkin pie at Thanksgiving dinner. In a house with many people, who is first to be able to use the restroom? How many stood in the hallway and said, oh, no, you, please, go first. Not our natural tendency. In fact, in our day and age, you don't find too many people who stand as they're going into a store and look back to see if they should be holding the door for the person behind them. We don't tend to think of others first because by our sinful nature, we are pretty much meat people. We're very selfish. But look at the centurion. His face shames us, doesn't it? I mean, can you imagine what he had to put up with when he was with other soldiers? You did what for your servant? You, you, you value that, that Jew? He's sick, died. Let him go, get another. There are plenty out there. But that wasn't the case. He valued his servant. He thought of him first, in spite of the peer pressure, in spite of the ridicule he might have received from his peers. In, five, in fact, in spite of if perhaps some of the stunned Jews who saw him doing some of these things and wondered, what is with this Roman centurion? What could possibly motivate him to do? What he was doing. Now, Scripture tells us in the book of Hebrews that it is only by faith that we can do anything that pleases God. And certainly, we know from this text that what this man did pleased Jesus, who is God. This Roman centurion no doubt had heard the Scriptures as he was stationed in this land. In fact, we hear of him doing some unusual things for a Roman soldier, professing his love for their nation, building their synagogue. He must have been a laughing stock back in the barracks. He didn't seem to care. No, this man had a faith that Jesus calls great because he put others first. Boy, did he. You know, the account in Matthew tells us that this man was, was found to die. In fact, he was paralyzed and in great suffering. You get the picture. I've got a nurse here. They don't know what's involved in taking care of a patient that's got those kinds of conditions. I mean, it's kind of messy work, isn't it? But he cared so much that he didn't just get rid of his servant. He went seeking help for his servant. And no doubt from the scriptures, he knew where to go. Perhaps in the synagogue, he heard that wonderful command from God that said, call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you and you will honor me. We're told in the text that he heard about Jesus. Certainly faith comes from hearing and hearing. And faith comes from hearing and, and the message of the gospel is that which produces faith. And it was that motivation, that God-pleasing act that followed. It led Jesus to say, I've not seen such a great faith in all of Israel. Okay, I'm, I'm ashamed. I almost always get the first cup on the coffee in the morning. I make certain it happens. Perfect temperature. Just right. Oh, I take my wife the second cup, but the first is mine. My name is Steve. I'm a selfish sinner. And when we look at what this man did, though, it does shame us as Christians, doesn't it? Maybe we've only seen this kind of, uh, kind of 
unselfish love in, in, in that of a, a brand new Christian. Maybe, maybe you've seen that in your life, where someone comes to faith and uh, goes to pastor's Bible information class and has this, this incredible zeal. You, you remember how you once had that too. And there again, you feel a little bit of shame. But the purpose of the text was not to, to make us focus on, on the centurion, but on the one who created faith in his heart. The one whose love had first touched him and moved him to be the kind of person he was doing, who had that faith that God created and was doing what God's design was intended for it to do. To think of others first. And so when circumstances arose in the centurion's life, he also knew what to do. Call on the Lord. In the day of his trouble. He had heard that Jesus was near. And he called upon the elders of the Jews to, to go and bear a message to Jesus and ask him to come and heal his servant. Notice he didn't ask for something special. Uh, come and, and, and honor me by being at my house for dinner. Uh, come and, and meet me. I've heard a lot about you. I, no, come. Heal my servant. Wow. He knew what to do. And there was no doubt about what to do. There wasn't any second guessing. There was a circulation among the Jews around there. You know, a good doctor. Sure, a local hospital. Maybe we get some help from a servant. The servant was dying. A miracle was needed. And only God can do miracles. Only God can defeat death. And so he sent these elders out with a message. And they carried this message to Jesus. Centurion's message was, was pretty clear. This man, they said, he deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. He wanted Jesus to come. And he said, come and heal my servant. Come and help this one whom I value greatly. Who knows, maybe it was the servant who had first said to his master, the Roman centurion, you should meet my Lord. That's what Christians do, right? Give witness, they tell people about the one who loved them first, the one who has loved them with an everlasting love, the one who, who alone can solve our problems. And the centurion had such a faith because he knew where the problem could be solved. He knew where the dilemma, the circumstances that had risen in his life could be dealt with. Only one could do what was needed for this valued servant of the centurion. And so he looked to Jesus confidently. Not with doubt, not like a, a wave blown by the wind as we heard in the second lesson. Like those Israelites marching around Jericho they believe what the Lord said. The walls will come down. The barrier that stands between you and victory will come down. Well, the response of Jesus was, was good, you know. I mean, uh, we had the, the elders, you know, they were, they were the kind of, he's good people, the oh, Lord, you know. Even they seem to miss the point. It wasn't that he built the synagogue. It wasn't that he loved the nation. That's not what made him great. What made him great, what made his faith great, was that God had created it and placed it in his heart. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith, even in Israel. Great faith. Oh, for a faith that will not shrink, we sing. Poverty and war. And all the various other things that enter our lives that cause us grief. Our fears rise up. When we think only about me. 
We don't want to be like that. We want to be like what we witness in the faith of the centurion. A faith that rested confidently on Christ, on Jesus as Savior. The one that had been promised to the prophets who would come and shed his blood. The one whose word, wound, and triumphant victory would assure forgiveness and victory for all of us. That's where faith rests. That's where faith finds its strength. And faith relies on God's grace. Because you see, we don't deserve it. The centurion knew that I don't deserve to have you come into my house. To even be under the same roof with you is something I do not deserve. We, we say much the same thing here, don't we? I deserve only your wrath and your punishment, Lord. Have mercy on me, a sinner. Can't help but think of Peter falling on his knees before Jesus and saying, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. But Jesus didn't leave. Jesus came to save. To give us life. To give us purpose. To bestow on us a faith that will not shrink. Recently I came upon a poem that I thought was kind of an important one to hang on to as an anecdote, if you will. For a purpose just like today. The poem expresses well the foolishness of not trusting in the Lord completely. The poet wrote these words As children bring their broken toys with tears for us to mend, I brought my broken dreams to God because He is my friend. But then instead of leaving Him in peace to work alone, I hung around and tried to help in ways that were my own. Finally, I took them back and said, Dear God, why are you so slow? My child, he said, what could I do? You never did let go. So oftentimes we cling to the circumstances that rise up in our lives. We have a tendency to grab the steering wheel of our lives right out of God's hands. Uh, because we think he's too slow, or not, not maybe on duty today, or maybe he is actually slumbering someplace and doesn't see the trouble that has arisen in my life. Maybe he doesn't love me as much as he professes to. When I think like that, I think what I've forgotten. The cross shed blood, the innocent Lamb of God, the one who bore the weight of my sins, who was punished for my transgressions, the one who came into this world to save me, a poor, miserable, ungrateful, undeserving sinner. A 19th century preacher by the name of Charles Spurgeon wrote in one of his sermons, a little faith will bring your soul to heaven. A great faith will bring heaven to your soul. May our gracious God who created faith in us through means of his word lead us to be a people who put others first as he did with us. Remember, we love because he first loved us. We, may we be a people that go to him confidently when, when trials come into our lives and, and, and the circumstances just seem so out of our control and, and we want to grab that steering wheel out of his hands. May we look confidently to him and trust in him to, to deal with these things. May we rely on his promises. Believing with all our heart that what happened on Calvary's cross was for us. That the sins which separate us from God have been washed away. And heaven's gates stand wide open. And on the other side are the Father's welcoming arms to his prodigal children. 
May we be a people who know what great faith is and hunger and thirst for the word that created it and Jesus the Savior and source of all that is needed.